Long Island. And it's not just Long Island. It's not here only in uh, Huntington. I, I just moved here, as you know, uh, less than a year ago from California, and especially in all the big cities and really even in between. One of the things that becomes a pitfall, pitfall, especially for younger people, is that if, they, if there's something that they don't understand about God, they see it as something that disqualifies God in their eyes. But that's a very, to me, that, that's actually a very silly view, uh, a very inaccurate and incomplete view of who God is. If God has to make sense to us only, and God has to make sense, if, if that's our criterion for whether we're going to trust God, then we'll never get anywhere with anyone, right? I think one of the most amazing discoveries we will make in God in our relationship with God, and we just welcome Brad as a full member of our church, but for all of us as well, all of us. If, if our presupposition is, God, you have to first make sense to me, then who's in control of the situation? Us. God says, no, come discover. Come discover. And that's what Jesus does. He brings mystery, and he brings us into God's mystery. And this is what I think Mary worships as well as she pours perfume on Jesus. She does it, number one, as we talked about, because he raised Lazarus from the dead. But number two, because she's also aware of what Jesus is about to do. And this is what he's been talking about. Specifically, Mary understands that Jesus, the one who has the power to bring even uh, the dead back to life, has come to Bethany to die. Hmm. That's a surprise. And, and not just to die, but Jesus had been talking about this for some time now. And, and of course, this is John's version, but throughout the four gospel, uh, the moment when people start falling away from following Jesus, the crowds that are around, is usually the spot when Jesus says, now you got to come die with me. That's part of what it means to truly come alive. And of course, people are like, well, I, I'm not, that's, not my, that's not why I'm here. But that's the mystery. And so when Mary comes and she pours the perfume on Jesus, part of what she's doing is she's saying, Jesus, I really, you know, and this is my speculation. I think what she's saying is, I don't fully understand. I, I've heard what you say that you're going to do, lay down your life for us on the cross. I, I get that part. I just don't understand it, but I'm willing to give it a shot and see where this leads. Because Jesus spoke throughout his mystery. <coughs> me. For instance, in John chapter 10, the reason my father loves me is that what? Yeah. This is not a, an afterthought on the part of Jesus. This is something that he had been talking about. No one, takes, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to, let, to take it up again. And this command I received from my Father. And again, notice, even as Jesus talks about laying down his life, it's a very different order of things. He says he has the authority to lay it down and he has the authority to what? Pick it up. Right? Jesus is bringing order back even into this, bro the most broken aspect of, of our human and, 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 frankly, physical existence. And that's what's happening here. But Mary doesn't understand. And frankly, you know, none of, none of the disciples yet understand. But part of worship, it seems to me, is that even though we don't understand, we bring ourselves and we meet Jesus and the mysteries of God. That's kind of awesome. And it's, it's, it's very key. And our worship is, is entering not into our space. Whose space are we in right now? Yeah, it's God's space. We are entering into God's space. And that's, that's the important thing. So as Jesus kept on performing miracles, 
The reality is that, you know, um, this is the last thing they wanted. They didn't want to enter into this mysterious space. In fact, uh, um, the reason why uh, um, Mary knew that Jesus was coming to die was that, ironically, as Jesus was performing all those miracles, and I mentioned this for the last two weeks, the anger of the, the, the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, they were growing. You would think, well, you know, the dead has come to life. The, the blind can see. The, the lame can walk. The, the crowds are fed. He walks on water. You would think this is the moment when the authorities would say, well, that's awesome. That's exactly the opposite. Why? Because they don't want to get into the mysteries of Jesus. And they don't want to get into the mysteries of God because they've already have it all figured out. By the way, if you have God all figured out, may I suggest this is a good time for you to reconsider whether you have it all figured out. Because that's a very dangerous thing. And, and so what ends up happening is that uh, John chapter 11, verse 48, Romans, the, the, the real fear comes out. The, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish uh, high council meets, and, and someone says, they're afraid of Jesus, and they got to stop Jesus because the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. This is John chapter eleven forty eight. 48. So verse 53, from that day on, they plotted to take his life. And of course, we read today at the end of today's chapter, uh, at the, today's reading, they now want to take Lazarus's life as well. They got to get rid of the evidence. They don't want this divine disruption. They want their order, their tradition, their likes. So this is the reality. And Mary understands this. She understands. And she remembers, I think, what Jesus asked her when Jesus first came to, to resurrect her brother. And he does it. First he talks to Martha. He says, you know, I am the resurrection of life. And, you know, do you believe this? And then and as, after he resurrects Lazarus, Jesus says to Mary, did I not tell you if you believed you would see the glory of God? And, and that's, what, that's what's happened. So therefore, both in appreciation as well as uh, 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 this profound sense of God's mystery, Mary anoints Jesus. He comes, he worships, she worships him, she anoints him with perfume, and, and this is what pure worship looks like. This is, that, that, again, that image, verse, uh, uh, verse 3, at the end, the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume, and, 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 and church, I, I, I think we will take another step toward revival when this house overflows with the, the fragrance of our worship to God. Amen? That's what we're working for here. This brings us to the third requisite for true worship, which is worship deserves costly sacrifice. And again, Mary's method of worshiping was to anoint him with that kind of nard, pure nard, and and. A lot of people focus on you know, the fact that it's a year's wage that it costs, um, you know, I don't know how much you make per year, you know. But that's not the only focus here. She doesn't just bring the nard. What does she do then? She, she, she washes his feet. What does she wash his feet with? Her hair, Right? This is a really risky thing, in, especially 2,000 years ago, right? 2,000 years ago, the only people who were supposed to see a woman's hair down was the intimate family of that woman. And she doesn't only risk economically, she risks her social standing because she recognizes that God is here and she holds nothing back. She takes down her hair and she uses the hair to, to, to clean Jesus' feet. And, and that's, that's awesome, right? And, and of course, the two things that uh, uh, I think, you know, a lot of us worry about. Um, I, I grew up, you know, I'm Korean-American, you know, I'm Asian. And what do Asians worry about? It's, it's a stereotype I, I, I regret, but, you know, we worry about our place in society, Right? Not that you guys don't, but, you know, for Asians, you know, it's, it's a big thing. Um, and, and we worry about, you know, whether we're going to be financially fit. We were actually not in our surprise that, when, you know, that college scandal, that more were not Asians. It was actually, you know, non-Asians in that college scandal because we thought we're the only ones who did that. But anyway, um, 
Mary, everything that Mary risks, financial and her reputation, that's exactly what then follows. One of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot, we know Judas Iscariot, he says, why wasn't this perfume sold and, and the money given to the poor? Right? Basically, we know why he's doing it, but that charge, you wasted your money. And, and we know from other uh, um, readings um, that uh, some, you know, Matthew, uh, Luke actually especially remembers people thought, saw what Mary was doing and they immediately said, that she must be a sinner. She must have lived the life of sin. Because why? She was taking her hair down, I think. And they interpreted that, they interpreted that action as kind of her being like a hussy, you know. Mary risks everything. And this is why Jesus says, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. And he says, you will always have the poor, which is Judas's kind of fake excuse. But G Jesus then rightly turns the attention back to him and says, you, all, you will not always have me. In other words, pay attention to what is central. Again, what do we risk in our worship? I remember when as a young minister uh, at the very church where I met Nan, um, what I, I was working with a bunch of college students. We had a large church and we had a large group of kids from uh, University of Washington, from Washington State University, from various other uh, uh, schools in Washington State. This was in Seattle. And one of my responsibilities every, sun, every Wednesday was to go to the center of University of Washington. Anyone ever been to UW? Okay. At the very center, there's this big piazza that's sort of uh, modeled after this beautiful Italian piazza. It's called Red Square. Um, and in the middle of Red Square, our, our thing was during lunchtime, we were all going to get together and we're going to pray together. And you know what really happened? About 20 or 30 college kids from, the, from our church would get together and we would form a tight circle inward facing. Because we were scared. And we didn't want anyone to see. And so I showed up and they said, oh, great, the new minister's here. Fix it. And I'm like, fix what? <laughs> you know, initially I was one of the people joining in. We were so scared because thousands of people are walking by us and we're here to worship. But you know, something amazing happened. We, we, we straightened up. We kind of shook ourselves a bit. And we started praying. We started singing some praise songs. We started worshiping. And, and all that we risked, we found that was nothing compared to what happened. Because consistently, every time we finally started turning around, other people started joining in. And we didn't turn around because other people were turning, joining in. We, we turned around and started worshiping, and that transformed the situation, and then other people started joining in. And here's Mary. She's risking everything, her money, her status, her dignity. Why? Because she's found Jesus, and she knows that he's someone worthy of worship. This brings us to the, th the three questions that I want to ask us today. Um, it's quite a lot, but I, I want to move on to uh, some closing questions in, in light of this. Um, first question is this, now that we've talked about worship. Who or what most occupies your mind from day to day? One of the interesting side questions that Jared C. Wilson brings up in Gospel-Shaped Worship uh, one of the things that we know that helps us understand what we worship is we spend our most number of hours, waking hours, thinking about it. So the first question I want to ask as you think about what it means for us to worship now. Here we are, we're central, and we're talking about worship. The, the most practical question is, what are you most occupied with in your everyday 
in your mind? What, what's in your mind? Right? Parents, how many of you are, are worried about your kids? Okay. How many of you are not worried about your kids? No, don't, don't raise your hand. Um, you know, how many of you are worried about your jobs and your performance on your job? Okay. Well, you must be doing well. Nobody cares about your jobs. Okay. How many of you are worried about, you know, I don't know, your spouse or some relative? All these questions, right? How many are you worried about your banking account? Yeah. These are the things. There's three things that normally uh, couples fight about. It's money, sex, and, and control. Okay? Money, sex, and control. Those are the things that couples fight about. Usually those are the kinds of things that we're, we're always occupied with. But the, the, the amazing question that I want to ask is that how, what does it mean if, and again, I'm not saying don't worry about those things. They're important things in your life. You know, worry about your kids. It's, it's I mean, in a reasonable way. But how would that transform if we then take that, I guess, obsession and every time we talk about it or think about it or we're obsessed with it, we start in interjecting, but Jesus is here with me. Jesus is here with whatever I'm worried about. And I can think about it, but my job is not just to worry, but to, to turn this into a worship. How would, how would that look like? Right? I'm literally hearing frogs. It's great. Um, Michigan frog. But... How, the, how would that change and transform our lives? If at our jobs, even as we deal with whatever difficulties, we are reminded that that's another time for worship. I saw this in my, um, I saw this in my life. Uh, um, my, my, my family doctor was a man who is just a great man. And he decided that his entire uh, practice was going to be a worship to God. And he, he went out of his way to take only the patients that no, one, no other doctor wanted. In the days when uh, geriatric wasn't paying a lot, he actually went looking for elderly patients. You know, in the days when, you know, I mean, he, he treated my family for, you know, pro bono all of our lives because he knew that we were poor. He didn't do it just because he was a good guy. He was a great guy. But he did it because his life was a worship. And so what occupied him was, yeah, he was occupied with his work. He was a brilliant doctor. But he was occupied in his work in a manner in which he was worshiping the Lord. What about you? What about you? First question. So who and what most occupies your mind? Number two. What do you do with God's mysteries? What do you do with God's mysteries? How many of you just decide, well, I'm just not going to think about it? That's a lot. By the way, that's a very rational answer. I don't know what the answer is. I'll stop thinking about it, you know. Our son called us yesterday, and, you know, he had a shock for us. He said, Mom, Dad, I might have to pay, uh, uh, like, you know, I won't mention the, the obscene number that comes up. He goes, I'm, I think we have to pay this much more next year. And my wife and I were like, ha, ha. You know, and, and her answer is, it, you can tell what the difference between her and me is. Her answer was, I must think about it. My answer was, stop thinking about it, you know. So we had this really, uh, we have this really great relationship where she thinks about it and I don't think about it. And, you know, we're just trying, you know, please stop talking about it. She's like, no, we got to talk about it. Um, it's a nice circle that happens, you know. What do you do with God's mysteries? What do you do when things happen and you don't understand? Where, whatever kind of person it is, it seems to me that one of the amazing things that happens, and it's possible in Jesus Christ, is that the mysteries of God in Jesus Christ becomes no longer that which is impossible, but that which will soon be revealed. Amen? In Jesus Christ, the mysteries of God will soon be revealed, and it really has to do with him. See, he's the answer to all this, but he, he appears as a mystery sometimes. And that's, that's kind of cool. So the second question I want to ask you is, what do you do with God's mysteries? Don't just ignore it. 
Don't just ignore God's mysteries. But see what happens. And finally, the closing question. What sacrifices? What sacrifice is Jesus asking of you in worship? What sacrifice is Jesus asking of you in worship? What does it mean for us to worship? What does it mean? The tendency, I, I think, and it's, it's, it's a natural tendency, is that we want everything to just be the same. And, and I'm not talking about music here. I'm just talking about our human tendency. We, we, don't, we don't like change. We wish everything would just... We try to use God's worship time as an opportunity for us to, to feel safe and be stabilized. And we come here thinking this is a safe space and this is, you know, a hiding place. And yeah, I get that's a part of the biblical imagery. But... What does it mean for us to come and really sacrifice as, as Mary does? To sacrifice our fortune, sacrifice our dignity, sacrifice our position. Not for this building or, or for, you know, whatever. But, but for the Lord who is the owner and the Lord of this place. What does that mean? What does it mean to really sacrifice in worship? To God. Again, I want to ask you to consider that in our lives. And that's, I think, to me, those are the, the, the lessons that I think we can and take away from uh, Mary as she anoints Jesus and worships him. Because ultimately, that's what life is all about. It's not about who we are and what we want and what we do. Ultimately, it really is about who Jesus is what he has done, and this is the exciting part, what he's going to do with us. Amen? I think Jesus is going to do a lot more with us than I think we oftentimes give Jesus credit for. See, he's ready. We're the one who's not ready. And, and my invitation to us is let's get ready. Let's get ready. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to, to reflect now on what it really means to worship. And we pray, Lord God, that uh, um, as we continue this worship with the Lord's Supper, that we would proactively allow ourselves to come forward and, and to worship you. May the focus of this meal not be about us and what we want. I want to invite the ushers to come now, to come, come forward now, and let's get ready for the Lord's Supper. But as we do... I want to invite the church. Let's pay attention. Let's put ourselves forward. Let's, let's let the Lord's Supper be our affirmative response to both the power and the, the dignity and the, uh, the majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ, but also to his mystery. Because the promise of Jesus is that as we take this meal, we're doing so in the anticipation, the mystery of his return. Let's get ready. Let's get ready. Lord Jesus, help us. Help us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. In just about a week, um, two weeks actually, this is what we're going to do here at uh, Central, the Thurs Maundy Thursday night. Uh, we do so in remembrance, but on, on the night before Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his closest friends, many of them who were there when, you know, when Mary poured out the perfume. He gathered them for the meal together. And in the middle of the meal, he lifted up the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Then he took the cup. And 
as he went through the, the various prayers of the Seder, he transformed one of the prayers from a, a prayer of religious ceremony into a prayer of betrothal. And then he lifted up the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. And, and his invitation to us is that he invites us now, just as he did in the book of John, as John remembered, to eat of his body and to drink of his blood. But he, he invites us to do so because we are now his. We are his betrothed. We are the church and we belong to him. And this is our way to affirm that he is the bridegroom and we are the bride. Church, are you ready to do this? Then let's do so. Jesus, be the one. Because where there is no one, there is no power, there is no freedom. The kingdom is here. Lay down my life. This is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for you in the cup of the new covenant. Let us eat and drink in remembrance of him, and let us proclaim his upcoming return.
Father, thank you for this, your great need. Thank you for providing not just the satisfaction for the body, but that mysterious, powerful, amazing communion that we have with you through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for coming for us. Now let us affirm our faith in the Lord by reciting together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he was he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand up together as we close out in worship. Water you turned into wine. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness. Into the darkness you shine. And out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God.
Folks, we should be clapping. We should be jumping up and down because if our God is for us, the, the God who brings not just new old order, but new order, the God who brings healing, not just in feelings, but not just in bodies, but in the total self, if our God is with us, and as we face our, our coming week, who can be against us? Right? We got it won. In fact, we didn't win it. He won it. We're just following along. It's a great job to be a Christian. Right? Amen? So let's go out and let's celebrate. We're going to do some really awesome things. And, uh, we're going to give a couple minutes for everyone to, as, as after this dismiss, uh, there'll be, uh, there should be an elder or a deacon here to pray for you. If you need some prayers, come forward. Oh, I, I will meet and pray with you. But also, we're going to be getting a movie ready, uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Like I said, it's uh, before the uh, uh, premiere uh, on the movie theater. So the, the company has given us an opportunity to show it for us. All they're asking is a uh, love offering, which is, which is great. But let's continue our worship, right? Because this is about worship. Whatever you face this week, whatever the challenges, whatever the highs, whatever the lows, let's worship, right? Turn to one another and say, Let, let's worship. Let's worship. Let's worship. Let's worship. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks. Thanks.